guys, it's Sugar and my husband Jeff. Hello. And tonight we're going to talk about our top 10 movies that are in anime. Yeah, it seemed like a natural progression of what we were talking <laughs> about last time because uh, when you look on my anime list, if you just sort it by pure score, it puts all of them together. It right. puts the TVs, the, the, you know, the specials, the movies, puts all of those together. So right. when we were looking to kind of rank our top 10, immediately we were like, well, I mean, you know, we've got this here, we've got Steins Gate up here, but also this. But that's a movie, so we weren't talking about a Movies top ten last overall. Time. Yeah. yeah, we were just talking series. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll follow a similar <laughs> format to what we did last time. Yeah, we'll start at number ten, work our way down, mention some honorable mentions. I guess that makes sense. And then we'll hit our number one. Yeah, and if one of us mentions something that the other person has on the list, we'll just say where we had it and then discuss from there, I guess. Yeah, same as last time. But if you yeah. haven't joined us yet, we'll explain everything. Um, we'll kind of get into some of the detail about why we like it, maybe about what the show is about a little bit so you get some interest. But uh, we'll start with Jeff. What's your number 10? Ooh, I get to start on this one, do I? Yeah. Uh, my number 10 is one of the more recent movies on this list that, that I watched for the very first time. Hmm. Uh, Professor Layton and the Eternal Diva. <laughs> that was my number yes. 10. <laughs> oh, we both have the same number 10. Fantastic. <laughs> That's good. It's so good. Um, I mean, first off, I should say that this is my favorite character in all of these movies. Right. So uh, part of me feels like I'm almost... A little biased. A little biased, but as well, I mean, take a look at something like Aladdin. Mm -hmm. Aladdin works and is as highly proclaimed as it is because of the genie, because right. of Robin Williams' performance. Right. And so there's lots of movies out there that hinge on one particular character being a little bit more, like, you know, being the central focus. Right. And bringing the joy into that, uh, into the movie. And I mean, Professor Layton definitely is that um, for those who don't know, Professor Layton is also a series of video games, which both Sugar and myself uh, really appreciate. Not necessarily for the gameplay elements, though, I mean, they're they're fun, they're serviceable, but it's about the character right. Professor Layton. I've played all of the games. <laughs> I am in love with the story. I'm in love with the characters. I'm in love... Um, especially with the cutscenes that they have in most of the games, it usually brings me to tears. <laughs> and the the anime is just it, it's like taking all of the cutscenes from a game, right? And just making a movie out of it. Exactly. And I like the way the movie is put together because in, when you think about transplanting a game to an anime or to an anime movie, you think, oh god, it's going to be very ugly or it's going to be missing something or the voice actors won't be there or so forth mm -hmm. the voice actors show up for this and it's very authentic um like there's parts if you've never played the games it's more of like a puzzle game and so they have different sections of how it would play out if, if something was shown to you and how you're kind of congratulated for doing so and in the movie it gives you that opportunity of this is our puzzle this is what's wrong and then they kind of give the audience a, a while to kind of speculate of what the next step would be, but not in an insulting way like Dora the Explorer or anything, where it's no, like, no. what is it? Like, <laughs> it's very fluid. It makes sense. And it's very exciting because you feel like, like in the games, you're a part of the journey. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I would liken it to, for those who just have never experienced anything like it, imagine a Sherlock Holmes type character who is 100% likable and is usually the best person in whatever room he's in in terms of just being a gentleman. It's one of the it's right. one of the main catchphrases of Professor of, Layton. Of Professor Layton is that he is a true gentleman. Yeah. And a gentleman you know. would do this. A gentleman would never do this. He is all about respecting himself and others. And so it's very fun watching him because you are very much on board with him doing well and the people that are around him because they are very uh i wouldn't say as, not even so much charismatic but they have their own unique kind of personality mm -hmm. um and it's hard not to like the show because especially with us having played the games you're like i know this character i know who's behind this like some of them were like oh that was a surprise that's a new character that wasn't in the game and so forth and it was just really enjoyable yeah, it felt like it could have been one of the games, but it also doesn't feel out of place just being a movie. Right. Which is very rare to have. 
and within the the whole anime scene you do have you have games which became an anime series which then became a movie or you had graphic novels which became this you know a, a sort of a sort of game like yeah. Steins Gate and the was more a game, it gets and then transferred it became a series so it seems to get diluted but in this sense it mm-hmm. stays very much to the source material of what the game wanted to project excuse me to project to others and kind of have that feel so mm-hmm. i really liked it mm-hmm. it's just and it's, and it's just good for the ex- whole family. It's There's no obscene words. I don't remember there being any... Like, not really any violence. There's a couple, like, tussles, so to speak. But it's nothing like... Well, I mean, like, it's like Rin Tin Tin style. Yeah, like, kind of. Know, that, that kind of... There's some combat, but it isn't, you know, not gorily beating It's a gentlemanly combat. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's oh. very, very good. Yeah, they just... Even the action sequences, which, I mean, you don't necessarily think when you're talking about... Oh, this is going to be a mystery with like a, an investigator and yeah. he's a gentleman, but he's also an exceptionally good fencer. Yeah. And he, you know, he's just, he's awesome. He's like Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> but if he was like a really good person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sherlock Holmes had a lot of problems, trust me. So, yeah, I'm glad it's both of our number 10. I think that's. I'm like interested really now. What's your number nine? Oh, I'm, I'm going to go with number nine here. Yeah. It's so my number nine, and this is. <laughs> Some some people call this sacrilege that it oh. would only be at number nine because it's the only anime film to ever win the uh, the award for best animated motion picture of the year, <laughs> and that would be Spirited Away. That's my number nine too. That's your number. Oh, as <laughs> you can tell, roll. as you can tell, we don't we don't discuss these beforehand right. because we want them to be a surprise. Right. Um, yeah, Spirited Away I have as my number nine, my first entry on the list involving Miyazaki. It won't. It won't be my last Ghibli not. film. It won't be my last Miyazaki film. Um, I think the... It, I would consider it to be the, the quintessential Miyazaki film. I don't necessarily think it's the best, obviously. Right. Um, but it is... There are a few movies which gained... Which, which made a leap forward for anime mm-hmm. in terms of their importance. And some of those movies will, will be coming up on my list as well. Right. Uh, this one... You know, it, it was the first one to ever even to uh, win. It's the only anime to win the best animated motion picture, which meant that it got a huge audience outside of who would normally be involved yeah. with anime films. Um, I, I remember... Love... Sorry, I was just okay. about to say, I remember seeing those awards, and it gave such validity to what we were watching and what oh, yeah. we were doing, because it's like, oh man, like people like on a, an adult level, so to speak give recognition to something that a lot of people demean where it's like i'm so glad it got that exposure Mm -hmm. absolutely um i love the fact japanese culture and mythos is very different from anything that we're normally uh we normally see in north america Mm -hmm. so most of the time the only introduction we get to japanese mythology and, and whatnot tends to be through you know japanese made products Mm -hmm. and it can be really heavy. It can be hard to understand what's happening sometimes. Right. The fact that lots of Pokemon are actually made and created with influences from Japanese mythology. A lot of the Digimon characters do too. They don't take the time really to explain that. You have to really go in depth and, and a lot of the audience just doesn't care. This is a very good introduction to simple Japanese mythology told in a way that is very easy to digest it's very easy to just enjoy it for what it is Mm -hmm. it isn't very heavy i mean it has it has some elements to it which can get heavy and if Mm -hmm. you really want to take the time to analyze it Mm -hmm. there's a lot there right but every single audience gets something from it it's absolutely beautiful in terms of how it looks how it's animated i would argue it's maybe the best looking miyazaki film i don't think that again it doesn't make it the best, but it, that that is something that you have to account for when you're talking about animation mm-hmm. is how it looks mm-hmm. and how it sounds. And it has an all-star cast, whether you're talking about the Japanese or the English, and it's at its core just a wonderful, wonderful fantasy story. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of, well, like what's most Ghibli movies, is the fact that there's always a character that somebody really likes or can relate to. 
I think the great thing about the movie, obviously, other than the art, is the fact that it kind of plays on the idea of what kids really think will happen of like, oh, if I separate from my parents, oh, this is a new place. And your imagination kind of starts to run wild. And it just kind of shows how something can build off of other ideas and how it can create this fantastical world where if you look at the beginning of the movie to where we end, I'm sure no one would have expected like, oh, I know this is where it'll go. It was very much like just wondrous in that sense. It was just really great animation, really lovely characters, very fantastical. It was, I, I can't think of a person, honest to goodness, that hates that show. I don't think you can hate it. You can, again... I like find that me. there's lots of movies where it's like, yes, I can see why that person doesn't like it. I can see why this wouldn't be for them. But I think anybody I've talked to, for them, like anybody I can think of right now, it's just, there's always something to like about Spirited Away. Yes, you can always take something likable out of it. There's yeah. No question about it. Oh, I need to watch that movie again. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking when I was making my list. I was like, I should watch it again. Yeah, every single one Because even like the bathhouse, like, I was just like, yeah. I was like, I remember that scene. And then watching anything with like um, Adam Savage, I'm like, oh, he reminds me of like how, what I should be watching. <laughs> I was like, really into that. When he got to... For those who don't know Adam Savage from Mythbusters fame, yeah, uh, every Comic Con goes out in, a, in a, at least one costume, if not multiple costumes. You and should see his Totoro costume; it was yeah, amazing. Totoro was amazing, but he also went as one of the most iconic from Spirited Away. I won't, I won't spoil it for you. You can go on YouTube yeah, and see take it. Take a look. See, but it is it's wonderful. It's really good. And the reaction that he got being in in that costume. And that people were like playing to the to the character. Yeah, it's it was just something that brings wonderful. a lot of joy to people. Mm -hmm. It's great. Uh, so I mean, I could go on to number eight if you want, or you can. I can guarantee eight. I can do eight because I know for certain that you haven't seen this movie, so it will oh, not be on your list. My number eight is one you haven't seen yet. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, no. Um, so my number eight. It's a bit longer name. It's called Into the Forest of Fireflies Light. It's about a girl who gets lost in the forest when she goes to meet one of her family members. And when she's in the forest and she's lost, she runs into a forest spirit. And I don't want to give really much anything else away, but basically it goes through the years of her spending time with this spirit and how a relationship can form. And it goes through the fact of understanding what mortality is and kind of understanding connections that we have with our friends. And it's like making compromises of what is doable, even between something that is and isn't real. And running into the right person at the right time, you know. Um, it's a very simple story. The art is very pretty. It honestly reminds me of Natsume. Um, just I was in that, about to mention, <laughs> I was I was like, like, this sounds like a movie version of it, some it, of the Honestly, when I watched Natsume. it, it reminded me of that. Because the spirit has even a mask on. So it almost looks human. Mm -hmm. Um... So that's all I want to say about it because really it's a very simple story, but it's very sweet and it's very memorable and the artwork is very soft and very lovely. See, this it sounds like the kind of movie that assumes that you kind of know a little bit about Japanese mythology and why these characters like um, why these characters act a certain way and why they portray themselves. Kind, kind of, kind of and they kind of explain like, hey, like this is why I'm in the forest, why I can't leave the forest sort of thing. So it gets into a little bit of that kind mm -hmm. of understanding. But yeah, I totally get what you mean. And um, yeah, it gets into a little bit of that because obviously the girl right away when she first meets him wants to know why he won't come with her. Yeah. And obviously he can't. <laughs> so, Due to um, the laws of <laughs> the mythology that exists for... <laughs> Well, it goes Certain into it, but I don't want to give much away. Very lovely, very simple and sweet story. Um, do you want me to go... Oh, yeah, you, you do know your number eight. Yeah. So my number eight, and this is... I love I love and hate the fact that Sugar has missed out on a couple of absolutely iconic <laughs> movies. Which means... Let me make clear. There is a lot of astounding anime. I just haven't been able to get to it due to, no, like, just fine. time or whatever. <laughs> that's... I love the make fact that... Make that very clear. I'm going to be able to watch you watch th these things for the first time. I've right. got a couple that are on my list that you haven't, uh, you haven't had the opportunity yet to see. Right. They'll probably come 
I'd assume after this, we'd probably watch them within the next couple of weeks and maybe yeah. immediately do kind of a, a post-movie breakdown podcast type thing. <laughs> Even sure. if it's like just a 15 minute, For you know, sure. this is, because both of them are, you know, mid, mid nineties or before. I think I know what you're about to uh, say, but. Number eight I have is uh, Akira. I knew it. <laughs> which, I, uh, arguably, I think people can make the, they can make the argument. That it hasn't necessarily aged uh, as well as some others. Okay. Uh, but it does have... Um, what it meant for anime cannot be overstated. Mm -hmm. What... I feel like what Spirited Away did for anime in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. Akira did the exact same thing in the late 80s. Okay. Which was that it, it gave validity to an art form which at that point was unfortunately seen by most people as oh anime that's that speed racer thing that's that you know and not for nothing you know speed racer was fine uh astro boy was fine but it led itself to a certain understanding what a lot of people had of what anime was mm -hmm. instead of what it could be akira is just it's a ubiquitous movie for the evolution of western audiences into accepting anime it is it is complex it is incredibly philosophical you every time you watch it you get something new out of it based on where you are currently you know in your life um it just i would say it speaks to the dangers of technology and what trying to trying to evolve humanity what that can end up meaning for humanity mm -hmm. and it also speaks a lot to the disassociation of youth away from mainstream so if youth are kind of discarded forgotten they are put to the side what can kind of happen with that uh, I don't want to really say anything more in terms of sugar because I don't want her spoiled <laughs> on anything um, there's probably some memes you've seen that will yes. make a lot more sense yes, after you I've watch Akira. Yes, I've had stuff Akira. sent to me and I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. um, it is not the best performed in terms of the, the English voice acting simply because at the time right. there wasn't as much of a desire to have it. So you're saying the sub is better? The sub would definitely be better performed on the whole. Um, I wouldn't say like the... The content hasn't really changed. The performances, though, are sometimes overly outlandish. Sometimes they are a little bit over the top. Okay. Uh, in turn, and there's not a lot of room in the English performances for subtlety. Okay. Which I feel like it could uh, it could use. But <laughs> that being said, uh, we own the Blu-ray. We can watch it and both as the sub and the dub just to kind of get a different idea. If anybody has has never done this before watching a dub but then putting in the english the english subtitles anyways sometimes it's just eye opening into what ends <laughs> up being what ends up being changed in an anime it can be night and day sometimes for some of them yeah so my, it would be interesting to do that i haven't done that yet with akira <clears throat> excuse me okay so yeah that would be my number 8 okay so do you want me to do my number 7 or um did you i could i could do mine okay go mine's ahead. another uh, miyazaki film Ooh. one that i feel doesn't get the attention that it really deserves uh -huh. uh, it was also one of the first miyazaki films i saw which could oh. it, it, it could be some nostalgia in there uh, -huh. uh but that being said i have mentioned it before that escapism is one of my number one things when it comes to anime okay i don't necessarily need um, we might talk about the differences between what we look for in anime versus, you know, Disney and, and Western animation movies, right. uh, after, after we're done with our top 10, but this would be the only one that I would say hits a lot of similar vibes to what I would get from a Disney movie, let's say. Okay. And that would be Castle in the Sky. Oh, okay. I thought I you were going I loved Castle else. in the Sky. I love the simplicity of the fantasy story <laughs> that they're telling. Uh, I find sometimes Miyazaki, while he creates fantastical worlds, sometimes you get lost in the world and the 
the humanity in it gets a little lost mm-hmm. in, in, you know, the, the grandeur of everything that's happening around. Um, part of the reason that I like this a little bit better than Spirited Away is, while it is a fantastical world, it's also a little bit more, it's a little muted. Mm-hmm. It's not as fantastical. It's not as heavily set in uh, Japanese mythology. Mm-hmm. It just focuses on a really neat little story and uh, just a couple of characters that I really liked. Right. I kind of enjoyed its simplicity, especially after... Like, uh, anybody who watches a lot of anime will always have that kind of... A little a little bit of sugar that you need. A little bit of me? <laughs> uh, after, um, after watching something really heavy. Mm. Uh, our, our wizard friend once uh, had watched... Oh gosh, I think it was Elfin Elfin Lied. Yeah. And he was like he was I need <laughs> I need something that is sugary, saccharine. I need just something that will make me feel good yeah. again. <laughs> and and for him that was bottle fairy or fairy bottle. I always forget which if it's fairy bottle or bottle fairy, but it doesn't have a lot of substance to it. It's just very sugary. That's I would argue annoying. that Castle in the Sky does have um, a lot of classic storytelling tropes. It has the, uh, you know, the the classic hero's journey and whatnot. It's almost, I feel in a way, it's Miyazaki trying to tell a more European style of fairy tale. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate it quite a bit. It's not as heavy as some of his other works. It's not as deeply held in Japanese mythology as some of his other works. It's like a Disney movie made by Miyazaki. Yeah. Excuse me. Gosh, I got the hiccups now. <laughs> um, but yeah, the one you were referring to is Bottle Fairy. I just didn't want to cut off your your way of thinking there. But yeah, I had it actually as my honorable mention because I really liked it. And I remember, I think it was after, ironically, uh, when I was younger, I always wanted to see it really badly because the trailer itself made me really intrigued. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because I think it was actually in the opening kind of credits for Sailor Moon, Hearts on Ice. It might have um, been, yeah. And yeah. And I remember right away then, I was like, I really want to see that. And because it was, I think, the Fields of Flanders. And then there was another cat one that was animated, but it wasn't Miyazaki. Um, trying to remember from my eidetic memory. <laughs> Anywho, but I just remember seeing it. And I thought, that's so great. Because it's like a young kind of boy and girl going on an adventure, kind of finding their way in the world where there's kind of adult kind of rule things. And I thought it was always a neat concept where it's very like, not almost magical, where he kind of dips into that again with the pendant. I don't want to get into too much because I don't want to give it away. But like, uh, I like that there's still that magic in it. And especially the castle in the sky aspect is so pretty. Like Mm -hmm. I've had so many people do artwork of just the castle in the sky and the things there. And I love it. And I always thought it was such a great movie just to watch. There is a couple scenes of violence, which I, again, won't get into, but just to be wary of. But I still find it's a very family-friendly kind of movie. Yeah. It's it's his Sleeping Beauty, I would say. Sleeping, Sleeping. Beauty, I, I feel sometimes. Like, it's not But a, I find, like, hmm. In, in, the <laughs> way, in the way that Sleeping Beauty, I find, doesn't necessarily have a lot of substance to it. It's a uh-huh. very simple, very classic story. Uh-huh. It's just told exceptionally beautifully and that stays with you. And of course it does have the benefit of having the best Disney villain that's ever been put to film. I know Jeff's but. trying to be careful because he knows it's one of my favorites. <laughs> it wouldn't be a... it wouldn't be in my top five Disney movies, but it's in my I obviously... appreciate it a lot more after having watched it on Blu-ray yes. within the last couple of years. So I, I showed like, it to him again. Wow, this actually really still holds up. Yeah. Like the music, the characters, the artwork especially. That's something I really appreciate about it. And I feel um, the, the same way about Castle in the Sky. Where and that's understandable. It's, it's not going to be... It's not that master class where you have to have deep thoughts and really critically break it down. Mm-hmm. It's just a beautiful, simple story. Yeah. I like it. And it gives you characters, like, one thing I really hate, and Jeff knows this very well about me, which it gives you characters that aren't likable, but not in the sense of, how can I explain it? I hate characters that are written in a way that force you to hate them and you just hate the movie. 
Whereas these people aren't likable, but you understand why they aren't likable. Yeah, they have motivation. They have motivation. They have, like, an actual, like, plot line. And that makes it more enjoyable to watch because you're like, okay, these people are terrible, but I understand that. It's not, like, <laughs> terrible for being terrible. That, like, uh, yes, a certain Miyazaki film that you... Uh, what's it called? The Secret hate. of Arietti, right? Yeah. That's... Uh, Secret it World makes of Arietti. Me mad because some of the characters are written just so you hate the actions it, it, yeah i won't get into it because i don't like it that much i appreciate those who do like it um because again always something to like in an anime usually <laughs> there's very few where i'm like there's nothing there's nothing <laughs> <laughs> so that i understand that completely awesome. going into yeah what's your number uh number actually, seven actually mine is a miyazaki movie and i thought honestly we were going to have the same one because you were telling the same kind of descriptors and i was like ah yeah 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 oh can i can i make a guess i bet you know what it is the cat returns it is is this a movie i bought for you <laughs> yes <laughs> when we first started dating uh jeff bought me this movie and i hadn't seen it so this is like between six and seven years ago um and because i I'd seen what I considered, though. I knew what Miyazaki movies were, I knew all the titles, maybe I hadn't seen all of them, but I knew all of them, and for some reason, The Cat Returns had slipped through my, like, <laughs> my inventory of what was Miyazaki. Like, a lot of people have done the same thing. <laughs> and it that's the thing. It just it, didn't get the same acclaim. And I know, it's so odd, because, um, it's a really good movie, it's I like... Don't... Did Miyazaki do it himself, or was that just a studio I Ghibli think it was film? just... I can't honestly say any more about Miyazaki. I'd have to double check here. But um, I know it's a Ghibli film, and then they did it with Disney partnership because when it was translated to English, it had really good voice acting like Anne Hathaway, uh, Peter Boyle, uh, Carrie El... I can't say his Carrie name. Carrie Elvis. Right. Thank you. I always have trouble saying his last name. It was name. one of the first ones where they partnered on it uh, for the actual release. Right. For those who don't know, um, Disney has jumped in at this point and done um, like essentially remastered a lot of the uh, translation the english translations for studio ghibli films and i'm gonna slaughter his name the producer was tokuma shoden so okay yeah. doesn't look like i a remember Miyazaki. it was it was oh wait I, I am i looking at the wrong one i'm looking at the wrong one <laughs> a takomi shoden was for a castle in the sky um let me think here um i'm just gonna look through because we actually have the video here in the house um so anyways, yeah. I'll let you talk for a few minutes while I look it up really quick. <laughs> It'll take <laughs> no, probably curious. like 25 seconds, but um, yeah, it. yeah, so what I was talking, <laughs> what I was talking about before was Disney and Studio Ghibli didn't get into the partnership that they have now until I believe later in the 90s, and so this was, I think, one of the first times. This is times, 2002. Yeah, this was one of the first movies that they released uh, after this partnership was made, so they didn't have to do like a remaster. They didn't have to get to get it all re. I was just reading here. It says the movie was the second Studio Ghibli film to be directed by someone other than Miyazaki or mm -hmm. Ta Takahata. So I'm not sure. Just offhand, I can look it up later and put it in the notes. So it wasn't either of them, but still, it was a Ghibli movie. So I thought I had heard of all of them. So yeah, it's. If it's not done by either of those two, it's normally... It's usually kind of under the rug a little. Yeah, under the radar a little bit. But I thought for sure, especially with that voice acting, I thought lots of people have to know about this. And even I've brought it up to people and they have no idea what I'm talking about. It's a very lovely show. Excuse me. <clears throat> as I'm hiccuping, as I'm trying to talk. Um, <laughs> it's very lovely. The voice acting is very lovely, especially listening to Anne Hathaway. I really am a huge fan of Peter Boyle, so listening to him, I love Muta. Uh, Jeff knows this very well because I had a bunch of like artwork I had done in our house <laughs> of Muta mm -hmm. and um, it's very much like Alice in Wonderland without like the acid trip without all the weird kind of gimmicky stuff it was very nice and it was just kind of a world of understanding about growing up and making choices and kind of understanding other people's perspectives even and I always thought it was very a very lovely movie yeah. And it's very rewatchable. Like, it's just so nice to watch. It's very fantastical. Like, I think one of the most iconic scenes that you would see from it, if you ever saw any pictures from it, is when she, the main girl in the story, is walking down, like, a, f a flock of birds. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and that's a very, like, iconic shot from that movie. And I find it's very lovable. And then again, we have another main character who's very, very gentlemanly and kind of has that etiquette and it's very sweet and i really 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 like it and i've watched it so many times <laughs> that's another one where like like i was saying about castle in the sky where the the meat and potatoes of the movie isn't that it requires 
a critical analysis. It doesn't, you don't have to deep dive into the themes or anything like that. It's just a wonderfully told, simple story that just appeals to Right. To you. And it's kind of like having the courage to stand up for others, having the courage to stand up for yourself. And it's just, it's lovely. It's very, and it's like a female lead show, and it kind of goes into the fact of people making... Julie does that really well. Yeah, very well. And the f kind of idea of other people trying to make choices for you and kind of standing up for yourself. So I think it's a really great message for younger kids, for anybody, really. And it's just like a great... You'd probably almost mistake it for a Disney movie because it fits that kind of criteria. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my number seven. It doesn't, it doesn't make my honorable mentions, oh. uh, but it is, I love it every time it's, every time it's put on. <laughs> She's basically subject to the it other, it's always on. The other thing about it is it's, it's a really quick watch. It's, yeah. I don't even think it's an hour and a half. I think it's around I, that maybe yeah. this. I think it's like 60, 50 minutes, I think, but I'm going to double 70 check minute mark. So. It's an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. So right around that 75 minute mark, um, lots of. Lots of movies these days feel like they have to stay around forever, and oh, it's, God, that's so annoying. It is such a it, it's such an investment. It's an investment of time. This you toss it on, and it's the same as three episodes of whatever you're binge watching. It's like, oh, all right then, fantastic, very quick, very wonderful. I like. And it. that's the thing. One of the can I say antagonists in the show? Like one of my friends wasn't sure on it, and I told him, oh, it's voiced by Tim Curry, and right away, it's, oh, watch it, like. <laughs> It's such a yeah. great, like, people behind the voices, and it's so enjoyable to watch, so. Anyways. It can't, be, it can't be overstated how important individual performances are, especially if you're watching it, um, if you're watching it dubbed, which I would, yeah, I would argue, dubbed. I think most of our movies have been dubbed at this point. It's probably how we, yeah, like we choose to. Yeah, like, the Forest of Fireflies Light, I know I watched it subbed. I don't know if it's been on, it's been dubbed. The other ones, as far as I'm aware on our list, have been or are, I think there is a plan to get them dubbed. Yeah, I think there's so. One there's one I I'm see. not sure yeah. about when I look on my list right now, but other than that, yeah. Anyways, yeah. what's your number seven? Uh, we are actually... Or your number six. six. So your be, six, sorry. Either your six or mine. But, uh, okay, Um, I can get into it, ironically. <laughs> Gosh, I guess the makeup thing... Um, ironically, this was this last year. If you've watched any of my videos, it just weirdly happened that... Uh, Jeff and a bunch of other people had wanted me to watch Perfect Blue, and I thought, oh, God, this is going to be so intense, because everyone's like, I want you to tell me what you think happened. And I was like, oh, God, if it's been this many years and no one knows what's happened in it, I don't know if I can solve it. And um, so I think, Jeff, you had it on your list too, right? Yes, I actually have it as my number two. I knew it would be, because I knew he wanted me to watch it so bad. So I was like, if he wants me to watch it, he has to like it. <laughs> I do. I... I, I appreciate everything that it does. Everything that it does. And watching it for the first time, like, in my later teens, mm -hmm. definitely I was I was dumbfounded by what what anime could be. Because at the time, I, I had started getting an understanding of that anime, oh, it, it can be for older audiences. This was the first anime that I had ever seen where I was like, this, this is literally for, like, Adults. This is 18 plus. <laughs> this is adult themes, adult situations. And if you showed this, I, I would hazard a guess that if you weren't at least in your mid to late teens, you would miss out on so much of what's going on. Yeah, I think I've mentioned this in another podcast where I've been into Anime Con here. Well, wherever here is, right? Um, <laughs> Canada. Canada. Um, and a young child, like, give or take 12 years old, said came up to me and, and he said that, oh, I really love Perfect Blue. Have you watched Perfect Blue? And I was like, what are you doing watching Perfect Blue? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> but no, I was just like, I'm not going to have this discussion with you, but yeah, Perfect Blue is good, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, it was just really funny. But um, anyways, Perfect Blue, I didn't, I kind of had an idea of what I was getting into, but at the same time not. Because I thought, okay, I already kind of have an idea of, based on what I heard where this movie's going. So I kind of had like pre-existing notes of where I thought it was going. Halfway through the show, like I mentioned in the video, I was like three quarters of the way through. I was like, I nailed this theory. I'm rocking it. And then at the end, I was like, I am so wrong. And so then I started watching it again and again and again. I think I watched it four times in total. 
And I started to appreciate it because there was just so many things going on. And I love a really good story that has layers because you think it's something on the surface. And then as you rewatch it, you're like, oh man, I missed that. Or, oh geez, like that meant something more. And now that you're watching it over, you're like, okay, that character wasn't in this frame. What does that mean? What does this mean? You know, and it's very very much layered in that sense where you keep looking for more and even when you probably like me like exhausted every level of the show you're still thinking well was there more did i like i remember just sitting up during that like week especially that weird period time frame where i was just like did i miss something else am i overthinking it am i underthinking it is there something else that i could link to this and i was like finally i was like no this is my theory this is where i think it is i think this is how it's meant to be, but I love a show that makes you question what you think reality is and mm -hmm. what kind of like, it makes you almost a part of that where you're kind of in that main character's step of being like, is this real or isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's and, so hard to pick apart when you're watching it the first time. And I, for those who, who haven't had the opportunity to see it yet, um, I would even say I, my immediate thought whenever people bring up the idea of like questioning what's real and what's reality and what and whatnot, people might go to the Matrix, and this is far beyond mm -hmm. what the Matrix does in terms of meshing reality with with um, with dreams, with the fact that with the fears, career, with yeah. dreams, with career, with mental illness, it so many things. Like I don't want to get too detailed to spoil anything. Well, they can, they can go watch your, they can watch your the video, video breakdown yeah. on it. Well, uh, Sugar will link you to that, I, I guess, in the I would totally uh, recommend you watch it first, then go to the thing and see if you agree or if you disagree, and we can kind of chit-chat about that. But, yeah, that's something I wasn't expecting liking so much, especially mm -hmm. upon rewatch. I was like, I should probably be disturbed, but I really like this. <laughs> and for anybody who... It, it's definitely a thriller. Mm -hmm. There, I mean... There are some elements to it. Some might be, well, this is a bit of a horror movie. No, it's it's a thriller through and through. Um, I I think it's very much like a Hitchcockian type movie. So if you happen to like that. Hitchcock style, Hitchcock's style of storytelling, his style of uh, giving Things you things being a more mystery, than what they seem. Yeah, yeah, definitely give it a give it a try. Like, <clears throat> I have it at my number two. Because I'm not a fan of horror. I'm not really the biggest fan of thrillers. I just don't gravitate towards those sorts of stories, typically. Right. And and I'm sucked in most of the time. I'm already there. <laughs> I was, I, I'm, I'm still shocked to this day how much effect it has on me as I watch. Like, my, my eyes just don't leave the screen. Right. I, I'm totally engrossed 100%. Again, it's my number two, partly for that reason. When something... When something destroys your entire sense of what you think, what what, what you think a genre is, mm -hmm. it 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 holds a place that's special in your heart. I don't know if it would hold up uh, critically speaking to some of the other films that I have, but anybody's top ten is going to be it, subject to it's fluid. You know, it's subject to where you are in your life, and it's subject to what you've seen and what you haven't seen, and blah 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 blah. Yeah, I think if you rewatched it recently. It might creep up on your list just because there's so many good things about it. But as you said, the list will change. It will forever change. Yes. Um, yeah. So what is your, I guess yours is number five? No, I'm on to number six. You're six. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I'm just thrown off by numbers today. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, my number six. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm flipping the script right now as I look oh, at this. He's changing his list. He has his pen out and he's scratching something out. Uh, I'm just, I'm flip flopping, <laughs> which flip -flop means I'll be talking about these two it, it, just in a different order. My number six is what I think is the best pure Miyazaki film, mm -hmm. and that would be Nausicaa. See, that's my number one. Ooh, that's your number my one. My number of all one. Time. My my number one is going to be one that um, it'll be on your list as well, but I know the reasons why it won't be number. <laughs> um, so Nausicaa is number six on my list. And here's where we get into, both you and I will get into some arguments with anime people because <laughs> neither, oh, of yes. us, neither of us will have in our top ten, at least, mm -hmm. uh, Princess Mononoke. 
Which... And I can, I know some people will be very angry about that. And if you want, I can make a video on it. It was actually going to be my very first video on this channel, but then we had some technical issues with my laptop and it was lost. <laughs> so yes. then I just gave up on that idea for a while because it was just getting so long and redoing it was becoming chaotic. And I was getting more frustrated with trying to capture that than, you know. But mm -hmm. anyways, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so the reason why I, I bring up uh, I bring it up and that I make mention of the fact now that it's not on my list is because the failures that I feel that film has, Nausicaa does not have. Right. They, they hit similar vibes in terms of what their overall messaging is. Right. In terms of what... Yeah, what the, what their message is going to be, the storytelling elements that they take in. I feel um, that uh, Princess Mononoke gets too convoluted, tries too hard to make everybody seem like they're somewhat justified mm -hmm. in what they're doing. And thus, it makes it very muddled about who your protagonist is, who you're rooting for. And sometimes I feel like if you're not rooting for anybody, then you are really totally lost on right. what's happening. Um, you don't have any of those problems with Nausicaa. No. It is absolutely wonderfully told uh, environmentalism type movie. Not necessarily even true environmentalism, but it is... Uh, Miyazaki has done a number of films, including Princess Mononoke and Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, that are about appreciating the natural world that is around you. Mm -hmm. Even My Neighbor Totoro has a lot of that built into it. Um, so it's nothing that is especially new, except for the fact that this was, I believe, his first studio film. Mm -hmm. So it was the first time Miyazaki was ever getting the opportunity to express something that is obviously very important to him in a film setting. And it, it hits the environmentalism and the fantastic world building that he can do. Um, there's so much world building that happens, visually speaking, where you don't need exposition to tell you what's happening you just get to watch the movie and you get to see what has happened you understand what the effects of certain actions are having in this world and it has one of the best female protagonists in an anime movie ever mm -hmm. and Miyazaki is no slouch in doing this Studio Ghibli is no slouch in doing this they have at least a dozen movies now where the protagonist is female is an exceptionally strong character is not they're not a disney princess they are just an excellent character who happens to be female and nausicaa he hit it out of the ballpark in his very first studio film as far as i'm aware uh i believe this was actually made before studio ghibli was even really made and then he made studio ghibli after the success that nausicaa had so I have it as my number six. It is my highest. It is the highest uh, movie made by Miyazaki that I have on my list. Right. And really, I, I just agree with everything that you said. I really love the idea of conservation. I like the idea of kind of uh, living in a world where you have to coexist with nature. And if not, well, nature will kind of go against you. And in the end, you'll see what the outcome will be if you keep fighting against earth and against creatures and i know some people would say it's a really heavy message but honestly if you've been looking at the last few years i don't think it's that far off <laughs> um like you know screwing with things like having wars and pollution and stuff like you see areas that are really toxic and kind of the precautions that they now have to take because things were ruined and i find like one of my favorite most wonderful scenes in nausicaa which doesn't give anything away is when she's sitting in uh it's kind of like a cave area and she's on one of the, I believe, Ohm skeletons. It's been a while. And um, just sitting there. And it's so beautiful, yet it's poison spores. And she's underneath, like, this glass kind of casing. And it's so nice. The music is lovely. The artwork, you know, it's earlier, so it's not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. But for its time, I think it's very lovely. Mm -hmm. um, the voice acting is great. Patrick Stewart's one of the characters in there. Like, that's <laughs> something that's hard not to love. Um... I find that, yeah, I, I, I don't, <laughs> it makes me kind of speechless because there's so many great things and like I could talk probably for a whole video of what it does right over 
what it does with Nausicaa, I mean Nausicaa, uh, Mononoke, because Mononoke, I feel, is very, very heavy-handed, where it's like, okay, you're dealing with spirits and all this other stuff and industrialization and all this other crud. And it's yeah, like, it's okay, like we just... Industrialization that's done for the good of people who need yeah. good things to happen and to them. And then kind of the message... Mu- everything the, is muddled a little bit. That's the thing. And in the end, the kind of message, I know everyone's argued over this, but really to me, it's kind of like, oh, we'll start over and just start doing it again. And it's kind of no peace had on either side. Whereas in the end of Nausicaa, we kind of have the understanding of what even though people don't get along, an understanding of what their harm is doing to others, and kind of an understanding to keep peace, they have to understand compromise. And I find that's a much very uplifting message rather than, you know, we're just repeated to kind of screw things up again and again and again, where Nausicaa, I feel like, has a very lovely message, has a very strong female protagonist again, and it doesn't, like, I find one of the problems with Mononoke is that a lot of characters flip-flop. And some of them are very, like, hostile, then they're nice, then they're kind of erratic and other stuff. And nothing's wrong with Mononoke in the sense of someone liking it again. There's lots of things to like about it. A lot of the creatures and things like that are very fantastical. But in overall, like, story, music, art, um, like, it's anything you can think of. I would maybe argue that the art, the artistry, the artwork itself in Mononoke... Looks but a again, better than you're dealing with something that came out later. Yeah. You had more advancements. It's like comparing, like, I don't know. I don't, know, I don't even want to say like something this stupid, but something like Babar to like Transformers. It's a whole other time period where animation has changed and yeah. ways of doing animation has yeah, changed. For sure. um, but anywho, like, there's lots of things to say that are nice in Mononoke, but I find there's more things to love about Nausicaa as a whole. And, like, creatures and things in there that are very mem- memorable. But for some people have just overlooked the movie, uh, certain scenes. Like, I feel like a lot of people just are focused on Mononoke. And then it just uh, kind of fixated on it rather than looking at the greatness of Nausicaa. Nausicaa is just a... I feel it takes the time... It takes the time that's necessary to tell tell the story and the message that it needs. Right. Mononoke feels like it's hitting some of those beats at a mile a minute. Right. Which things some are people, happening fast. Some people like. And I've been on record of saying I like things that are very fast paced, but I feel like especially a message of conservation, I feel like Nausicaa does a better job of lingering on those moments of this is how important this is. Mm-hmm. This is the seriousness of this situation. Whereas like Mononoke is just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> and like even like I find that even for younger kids, Mononoke, I don't feel like I could watch that with my niece. Whereas, like, that would, some of the scenes I won't get into would bother her. Whereas, like, I could comfortably watch Nausicaa with her. She'd understand it. Maybe not, like, the deep, deep messages of either movie, but yet the simplistic message. I feel like that would be more obvious than watching Mononoke, which is very, like, (laughs) I can almost say the word scarring, because when I watched it the first time, I was like, holy smokes, (laughs) that's a lot to take in. (laughs) Boy, that's a lot to take in an hour and 45 minutes. (laughs) So, but anywho. So, yeah. It's just my thoughts. Nausicaa, I have it number six, and that's your, I hit your number one already. You did? Oh, my goodness. Um, if we're gonna, if we're gonna snake this, I guess I, I go to number, my number five now, which... I just flipped from my number my number six and five oh, as opposed flopper. to my yeah. <laughs> so my number five uh-huh. is Ninja Scroll. Oh, I can understand that, and it's a funny story. Jeff just looked over at me and smiled, and I know why. Because when I first watched, uh, I I remember when we first met. I talked and talked and talked about Basilisk, and he's like, "You're gonna want to watch Ninja Scroll," and I was like, "Okay." So I put it in, watched it. And I was so angry because I was like, Basilisk ripped off so many things from Ninja Scroll. I was so angry. Was, was inspired like... by. <laughs> to me, and... it's ripping off like scenes. Like, I was like, wow. But anyway. Uh, so, this is another one that is, uh, first of all, exceptionally for adults. Yes. Only. Not for children. Not I, at I can all think of the exact scene of why it's not for children at all. Well, there's lots of scenes. There's lots of scenes, but a very specific scene. It um, is. The best way I've, I've found to describe it to people mm-hmm. is take a, take some of the conventions of regular shonen, mm-hmm. ad, adult it, and adult it. <laughs> turn it, turn it. That's almost, how you know we're adults. Adult it, adult it, and turn it almost into a, more of a classic western. It feels like a like 
like a Western inspired sort of shown in and not in terms of, uh, you know, gunslingers and stuff like that. This isn't, mm-hmm. you know, we're not talking tri gun. I can or see what you kind like of think that. of like, kind of like that, not like desolate town, but kind of like that. I don't know how to explain it, but like I get like kind of like deserted towns and kind of going through well, and meeting other people. Yeah, it definitely was inspired by uh, lots of other typically Western type shows where it's all about this, you know, one lone uh, mercenary who just happens to get himself involved with certain people and certain events and literally just kind of he's reacting to everything that's happening around him. It's not necessarily that he was going out looking for a fight or anything like that. A fight just comes to him. And the great thing about it, first of all, uh, the main protagonist is exceptionally likable. He is just a very good person mm-hmm. in a world that is not populated with very good people. Mm-hmm. Um, he is exceptionally skilled. He meets a bunch of other people, uh, other combatants who are exceptionally gifted mm-hmm. in some ways. Which is where you get a lot of that shonen styling to it. where Oh, it is labeled as, as a shonen. Yeah, as soon as you kind of meet up with one person and you're like... Wow, that enemy was really unique and interesting. Like, what are they going to do to to trump that? It isn't like an escalation. It's just another person who's got this weird ability, and you're like, how, how in the world is a guy with a sword going to fight that? Yeah, if you watch Basilisk, you have an idea of what it is. (laughs) I was so betrayed. (laughs) And so, Ninja Scroll is just—it's the perfect sort of telling of that story. Of that that conceit in storytelling, you know the yeah. the one mercenary who happens across a bad situation where somebody is getting uh, mistreated and takes it upon himself to say, you know what, enough is enough, and I have the ability, I have the skill set necessary to stop this, and he does, yeah. and he deals with the ramifications of all of that. It is exceptionally brutal. It is exceptionally adult oriented. Yeah. It, it, um, it's a very, again, a, a, another one of those situations where it, the story isn't very deep. It isn't philosophical. It isn't anything like that. It's just the simple story of a man trying to get by as a mercenary and some of the stuff he has to deal with to do Kicking that. Kicking ass and chewing bubble gum and he's all out of bubble gum. <laughs> It's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum, and I'm all out of gum. <laughs> so, yeah, I have that at my number five. Again, it's one of those movies uh, that introduced me to the more adult-oriented mm-hmm. uh, Very anime. Adult. <laughs> uh, I'd watched that probably like two months after I watched Perfect Blue. So again, it was like, whoa, wow, this is <laughs> a lot of adult stuff. So happening. different. Yeah, I would have been like 17 or 16 at the time, uh, and yeah, it just. If if you don't if if you're not the biggest fan, let's say of shonen conventions of you know all these people have like different fantastical powers, you're still going to like the fact that the protagonist is a really good guy and kind of the storytelling that happens there. Mm-hmm. If you don't care so much about the western sort of inspired, it's uh, kind of like story, more like fantasy. You can get involved with that whole these people with unique abilities and kind of this landscape that's very like mm-hmm. mixed cultural. Stuff. Yeah, and so it, there's something there's something to like for any anime fan, basically. And it's right. another one that I would say, well, it doesn't hit the same level as like an Akira or Spirited Away in terms of how important it was mm-hmm. to to the genre. Mm-hmm. It still is an exceptionally good film that introduced boatloads of people into what uh, into what anime can do. Right. That's different than. I still, I, I struggle to this day to think of any Western cartoon, if we want to use that word, that hits the same sort of mark, the same sort of storytelling. Basilisk. <laughs> Basilisk is an anime. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. I thought you meant like any anime that made it to the West that was like that. And I was like, Basilisk. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I'm just talking for... like Western animated. I can't think of one that hits I'd... that sort of level. Where, like I said... I Not that com- dark anyways, I can't think of anything. I compare it more to like what you would have seen from, you know, Clint Eastwood and John Wayne. And but those much darker. Of, uh, those can get pretty dark too. They just don't show the darkest parts like <laughs> Ninja Scroll does. I don't know if Ninja Scroll made your top ten or not. But. It didn't. It didn't make my honorable mention either. 
but it is something where I can appreciate why people like it. I've met a lot of people who like it. A lot of our friends like it, and I was instantly like, you should watch it. Because um, that was early, uh, er, <laughs> early, er, I can't remember exactly when I watched it, but because of Jeff, I watched Ninja Scroll, because I mentioned how much I like Basilisk, and then after watching that, I realized how much I hate Basilisk. <laughs> to, be, uh, to be fair, I'm sure Ninja Scroll, if you go back enough, uh, has taken a lot of inspiration from other things, There's always too. that, too, but uh, there's a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot. Of stuff. If you like Basilisk, you will like yeah, Ninja Scroll. yeah. So, I can understand why people would like it. It is a bit darker, in my opinion, than Basilisk, especially one scene. But it also has pretty dark scenes of Basilisk at times, too. So, it kind of even each other out in terrible... <laughs> not terrible bad, but I mean terrible adult, things that people do. Themes. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, I'll get to my number five in just a minute. We're going to grab some snacks, and we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> 